Church. So happy to see you all. Go ahead and take a seat. This morning, our scripture reading is Genesis 2, 26 through 28. Feel free to pull it up on your device or in your physical Bible if you would like. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This is the word of the Lord. And together we say, thanks be to God. Hey everybody, um, welcome to Westgate. Uh, I'm so bummed that I can't be with all of you today. I'm in Chicago gathering with some pastors from around the country. Can't wait to be back home with you, but I wanted to introduce all of you to our guest speaker today. Joshua Ryan Butler is a pastor in the Portland, Oregon area. He's the author of several books, including The Skeletons in God's Closet and The Pursuing God, um, most recently Party Crasher, uh, and um, a couple of years ago wrote a book, a beautiful book that is available in our resource center called Beautiful Union. And today, as we continue our journey through Wonderfully Made, Josh is going to teach us about what the Bible has to say about being male and female and the beautiful window that is into the divine architecture of the world. I can't wait for all of us to learn from Josh, who is also just a dear friend and one of the most kind pastoral um, people that I know. So would you please give a warm Westgate welcome to my friend, Josh Butler. Hey. Good morning. Wow. Good morning, Westgate. Thank you for that warm welcome, both Saratoga and South Hills. It is so good to be with you again. Been down here a couple times over the years, and you are beginning to feel like extended family. So thank you for the welcome. Well, my family, we love taking sunset walks. Over the years, we've lived near this beautiful park with scenic views. And so as the sun is going down, we like to go out and take walks. And our whole neighborhood, I found, comes out at sunset. Like, I'll sometimes go out to the park earlier in the day, and it's virtually empty, like vacant of visitors. But you come back a couple hours later as the sun's going down, and you'll find, like, lovers holding hands. You'll find friends walking and talking, kids running around, families having a picnic. We all just love to come out and see the glory of sunset. And I want to ask you this morning, why are sunsets beautiful? Why are they beautiful? What is it about that moment when day and night collide that causes us to come out of the woodwork to gaze upon that radiant splendor? Now, sure, you can scientifically dissect it, right? Light rays on sojourn from the sun, they scatter through our atmosphere and ricochet until reaching our retina. But to reduce it this way is to ravage it. It's to miss out on the glory of what's happening. I want to introduce you to an ancient vision of nature, a more romantic perspective of nature, one that is more poetic and beautiful and powerful. Sunsets are beautiful, God says, for the same reason that sex is powerful. It's when the two become one, when day and night merge their diversity into union. Sunsets are beautiful union. Now, we're in a series here at Westgate called Wonderfully Made, where we're looking uh, over these weeks at the body and sexuality, gender, singleness, and marriage. The last two weeks, uh, you've been looking at the body and sexuality, and today we want to explore how these themes fit within the broader structure of creation. Creation. Man and woman are introduced on page one of the Bible. Genesis 1, verse 27 says, God created us in his image, male and female, he created them. 
What we can often miss, however, is that they are not the only such pair. This is verse 27, and if we work our way back up to the beginning in verse 1, the opening verse of the whole biblical story reads, In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. So before man and woman ever step on stage, we step onto a stage of a broader creation, the structure of creation in heaven and earth. Male and female, heaven and earth. Which brings me to my first point this morning, that man and woman are together a window into the beauty of creation. Let's talk about the beauty of creation. Genesis 1 introduces us to three marriages, three complementary pairs that are made with and for one another. We have land and sea, night and day, and heaven and earth. On the first three days, God forms these spaces, and on the second three days, he fills them with abundance and life. These beautiful pairs, now they structure creation. You can think of heaven and earth as framing the, hor- or, I'm sorry, the vertical dimension of up and down. Land and sea is framing the horizontal dimension of side to side. And night and day framing the temporal dimension of time. And guess where the most beautiful places show up? Where the two become one. Let's start with land and sea. Now, the land is beautiful on its own, and the sea is beautiful on its own, but there is just something majestic about when they come together. As the philosopher Peter Kreft observes, The shore, he says, is the most popular place on earth. Waterfront property, like you got here in California, it's the most expensive property anywhere in the world. Because, why is it? Because, he says, that's where the sea and the land meet. That's where man and woman meet. The land without the sea is kind of boring, desert. The sea without the land is kind of boring. When are we going to land the ship? But the place where they meet, that's where all the action is, and that's where we want to be. Now, I'd push back on his claim that each is boring on its own. There is a romantic beauty to the desert, and sailors write sonnets about the sea. And yet, in the bigger picture, he is on to something, that there is just something about the beach. We are drawn to this place where the land and sea merge. Its aesthetic is magnetic, right? And we will shell out top dollar for that oceanfront view, whether here on the sun beach, uh, sun-kissed beaches of California or on the rocky coasts of Northern Ireland or on that island resort in Thailand. There's just something about the beach. Now, coasts are just the largest example, I would suggest, where colossal continents tangle with their tectonic match in oceanic bodies of water. And yet the magic works on smaller scales, too. Think about it. Historically, cities are built along rivers. Cabins pop up around lakes, and oases sprout up in the desert. Because where soil and stream collide, life can emerge. Not only life, but also beauty. When river and rock caress, beauty is formed. As a buddy of mine, Brett McCracken, observes uh, that River and rock together form a mutually formative marriage. Think about it. What are waterfalls but water traversing rock? What's the Grand Canyon but rock carved out by water? As McCracken observes, he says, Water and rock together are nature's most beautiful artistic pairing. Water can erode and mold and smooth rock. Rock can guide and contain and filter water. Their wrestles are necessary and good, and they create beauty. That's why we flock to these places, artists and painters and poets and photographers and tourists. Like we go to the Cascades and the snow-capped glaciers and the geysers and uh, these mountains with, covered in snow. Because where these two become one, it's awe-inspiring. All right, so land and sea are our first pair. They are a complementary pair made with and for one another. And when they come together, it creates a holy space where beauty is formed and life can emerge. Now let's move to our second pair, day and night. Now once again, day is amazing on its own. Most of life happens under the sun, and night is beautiful on its own. There's just something about camping under a blanket of stars. And yet something magical happens when they meet up for their twice-daily tryst, right? Sunset and sunrise are spellbinding. Now, there is a good reason that our neighborhood comes out at sunset. 
<clears throat> it's glorious, right? Like sunset is that moment when the sphere of energizing light crosses the border of the horizon and sinks into the womb of darkness, erupting forth in a volcanic explosion of color like sparks of euphoria flying from lovers in ecstatic embrace. Now, the point here is not to sexualize creation so much as rather to creationize sex, to see how male and female fit within and bear witness to this broader structure of creation. Did you know that Shakespeare saw the romance in Sunrise? In Romeo and Juliet's balcony scene, perhaps the most classic love scene in all of literature, Romeo compares the arrival of Juliet to the breaking of dawn, saying, what light through yonder window breaks, it is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Shakespeare is the master playwright. He identifies Romeo with the night who comes under the cover of darkness, and Juliet with the day who outshines the lunar Rosalind. And he sets this moment uh, where they come together at sunrise, where they pledge their love and they hatch their plans to marry. This timing is appropriate, for it is the moment when the two become one. All right, well, we've looked at the marriage of land and sea and of night and day as beautiful union. But finally, let's move to our third pair of heaven and earth. And here we come to the mountaintop. Now, mountaintops, these were sacred space for ancient peoples, and this is true in the Bible as well. The mountaintop is seen as a place where heaven and earth touch and connect. So in the Bible, we find that Jerusalem sits atop Mount Zion. Moses encounters God on the heights of Mount Sinai. Elijah calls down fire at the heights of Mount Carmel. Jesus is transformed on the Mount of Transfiguration, And the Garden of Eden, we're told in the book of Ezekiel, it rests atop the mountain of God. The holiest encounters with divine glory occur on the heights in the biblical story. The mountains are like Jimi Hendrix. They love to kiss the sky. Now, we still love the mountaintop today. Climbers will hike to the peak for a taste of transcendence. The weary will ascend on retreat to get perspective and rest. We still speak about the mountaintop experience as a metaphor for high points of clarity in life. I grew up in the shadow of Mount Hood here, and she is glorious. We're still drawn to these places where Alps and atmosphere collide. In the Bible, however, heaven and earth are about more than just soil and ozone. It speaks to God's sphere ours, God's heavenly presence threaded through our earthly cloth. So when Jesus teaches to pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he is teaching us to pray for the union of heaven and earth, for the collision of God's sphere and ours, for the coming together of creator and creation. And in this wedding of heaven and earth, the divine presence indwells our earthly existence and beauty is formed, new life emerges. This becomes a holy space where the king is united with us as his bride. Okay, well, what is the significance of this? This brings us to my second point this morning. Part of the significance, I believe, is that creation is a window into the beauty of God's love. All creation is a window into the beauty of God's love. The beauty of God's love for you, that you were made by love, in love, and for love. The love of your creator. That the marriage of heaven and earth, land and sea, night and day, and male and female points to a reality greater than them all, which is that you were made to be united with God. God not only created the world for diversity and union, he created you for diversity and union, that you and all the diversity and uniqueness of your being and particularity of your story would find yourself connected to and united with your creator, the maker of the universe, that you would know him in a way that he would come and you would be united with God in Christ and know this love that floods the world. Every sunset is a reminder. Do you believe that? How would it change your life if you really did trust 
that that was true. All the world bears witness that you were made for diversity and union, to be united with God in this affection that floods the world. Now, some people today, listen to the word on the street, some people today say that the world is meaningless. The sun's burning out, and we're all just going to kind of descend into frozen darkness eventually, but don't you believe it. Nobody believes such things at sunset. We're too captivated by the glory and the radiant splendor. All is full of love and the mortal words of the great artist Bjork. (laughs) You live in a beautiful creation, and God not only loves the world, but God loves you. So much so that he came in Christ to be united with you forever. And this can be hard to remember when you doom scroll the news and see wars and rumors of wars. When your friend stabs you in the back and you find yourself feeling isolated and alone and betrayed. When that diagnosis comes back and your mortality comes crashing through your front door like a battering ram. Do you know what I recommend doing at such times? Is go outside. Look up to the mountains. Hike one if you can. Walk by the water and soak in those signs of life. Gaze like a child upon the sunset and let the rhythm of creation remind you in your bones that the sun will rise again. The beauty of creation has a structure and a stability that speaks to God's great love for you. Whether you're single or married, young or old, you are made for beautiful union with God. This is the greater union that you are made for, for beautiful union with God. All right, so what does all this have to do with sexuality, gender, and our bodies? Everything. God saves the best for last. God creates humanity as the pinnacle of creation. In Genesis 1.27, God says, so God created mankind, it says, God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This three-line poem, it is the climax of Genesis 1, and it says God created us, male and female, together in his image. Meaning we were made to image or reflect realities greater than ourselves as men and women. So male and female here are a fourth and final complementary pair created together for the beauty and life of the world. As the theologian N.T. Wright puts it, he says, the man and woman together are a symbol, a symbol of something which is profoundly true of creation as a whole. The coming together of male and female is itself a signpost It's like a sign that's pointing to something greater. He says, the coming together of male and female is a signpost pointing to that great complementarity of God's whole creation, of heaven and earth belonging together. What he's saying here is that man and woman together are a pint-sized portrait of heaven and earth. We are a window into the structure of creation. Which brings me to my third point for today that Genesis 1 speaks to the beauty of the body. Genesis 1 speaks to the beauty of the body. Now, we're not talking here about cultural definitions of beauty, like Instagram filters and airbrush photos on magazine covers. No, we're talking about a beauty to the body itself. Young or old, abled or disabled, all different shapes and sizes, God created the human body, male and female, as good, very good. What are male and female? Now, that is a contested question today, and I know that sex and gender are controversial topics. My goal here is not to address everything, but I want to give us three big-picture observations from Genesis 1 that I think can help. Genesis 1 says that male and female are, first, a biological category that has to do with our bodies. Genesis 1, the broader surrounding context of male and female here, Genesis 1 is all about bodies, the bodies of sun and moon and stars, of trees and mountains and rivers, of lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, right? It's about the concrete physical structure of our world. Now, 
the biblical story has not yet gotten to the interior world of our emotions and psychology and these things. These are important. They're extremely valuable. And scripture has much to say about them later. But here in Genesis 1, where male and female are first introduced, it's not gotten there yet. Rather, it's talking about our bodies and the goodness of the visible, created, physical world. This means that God cares about your body. As Jesus said in the first week of the series, you are not a soul that has a body, you are rather an embodied soul. That your body is bound up with your creation as a person in the image and likeness of God. Okay, second, Genesis 1 also says that male and female are a procreative category, having to do with how life is generated. We see this in that immediately after male and female, he created them in verse 27. Then in verse 28, God blesses them with the ability to be fruitful and multiply. Now, this is interesting. Earlier in Genesis 1, it's used the more generic term for humanity, just kind of humanity generically. But now, as soon as male and female are introduced in verse 27, this is immediately followed by God blessing them with the call to be fruitful and multiply. And this order, this progression, this makes sense logically for male and female is how we fruitfully multiply and fill the earth. This can be seen in the root of the term gender or gen, which means to give birth, beget, or give life. It can be seen in other terms like genitals or generate or generation. And this makes sense for as the theologian Christopher West observes, when the two genders combine their genitals, they are able to generate the next generation. Right? <laughs> yeah, so male and female, in short, have to do with how life is generated. Now, I recognize pastorally that this can raise painful issues for some of us, the reality, the painful reality of infertility. Right? And I believe this helps, rather than diminish that pain, I believe it helps explain why that experience can be so painful. And if that's you this morning, I want you to know that God loves you, that your marriage is just as valuable as any other. And we see throughout the biblical story that God is very close to those who walk the painful road of infertility in a unique and special and powerful way. And I know uh, that many of you are walking together, even here at Westgate, through that experience to support and walk with one another. What we see here what male and female are, that male and female are a biological category, has to do with our bodies. They're a procreative category, having to do with how life is generated, that each of us here in this room, we've come to into existence, the union of mother and father. And third and finally, male and female are an iconic category that is bound and wrapped up with the image of God. So the context here in Genesis 127, where male and female are introduced, is this three-line poem centered on the image of God. And what this means, the, the whole person is the image of God, body and soul, right? It's not just a part of you, like you the, you, the whole person is made in God's image. And we also see here that male and female are together the image of God. We need both to get that fuller reflection of the divine glory that a room just with a bunch of dudes or a room with only ladies, we don't get the full bigness of the picture of this diversity and union that God has made to reflect his glory into the world. We need men and women both. We also see that we are created not only in the image of God, but also in a sense like as an image or a sign of creation, of heaven and earth and the structure of creation that this means God has inscribed a sacred symbolism in our bodies that points to realities greater than ourselves. That sexuality is about so much more than just pleasure-seeking, right? No, it's about sacred symbolism that points us to the structure of heaven and earth, to the nature of our union with Christ as his church, and the life-giving power of life through his spirit. This means that your body is sacred. Hear me, your body is sacred. You don't just have a body, you are a body. That you and I, we are embodied souls and ensouled bodies. That you were made to image or reflect something of your maker, your creator, and how you live through the beauty of your body. All right, well, I want to address a few practical questions that often come up when we're talking about sexuality, gender, and the body. The first question would be this, well, what about singleness? Josh, you're talking a lot about kind of marriage and these marriages, and does that mean that if I'm not married, I'm missing out? No, 
The beauty is available to us all. The beauty of it is available to you, whether single or married. The reality is that Jesus was single and Paul was single. So if you're single this morning, you're in very good company, right? We find that the New Testament actually elevates a very high view of singleness as equal to, if not preferable at times, to the vocation of marriage. That singleness and marriage are both uh, equally valuable vocations in the kingdom of God through which we can love and serve God in our place in life. And the reality is that you can have the reality without the sign. That you can have the reality of union with Christ without the sign of marriage that points to it. This means that you get the movie without having to sit through the sneak preview, right? Like you can enjoy the full meal without waiting through the appetizer. That the reality is we can have this reality of union with Christ, whether or not we have the sign. This means that if you are uh, single and don't want to be or single and do want to be, whether you have a marriage that's great or a marriage that is struggling, some of the loneliest people I know are married. And wherever we're at our place in life, this union with Christ is available to us in God. I love how Jesus is both. Jesus in his own life. Jesus is both the great bachelor who gives up sex and marriage and family on a horizontal level, But he is also the glorious groom who gives his life for his bride on a vertical level. That Jesus, hear that again, Jesus gives up sex and marriage on a horizontal level in order to give his life for the reality it points to on a vertical level. The union with him that we were made for. This is countercultural. This high elevated vision of singleness, this is countercultural because we live in a culture that often will say you have to have sex or marriage or whatever in order to be fully fulfilled or have a truly meaningful life. And that's hogwash. That's not true, right? There was a movie that came out years ago called uh, The 40 Year Old Virgin with Steve Carell, right? And <laughs> that title was kind of like a joke, right? Like there was this sense of like, ah, he's 40 and he hasn't had sex. Well, you know, like it was almost like just a, implied in our culture, this sense of like, oh, it's kind of humorous or comedic. But here is the problem that Jesus was a 40-year-old virgin, right? Or at least a 33-year-old one. And Jesus lived the most fully human, meaningful, God-glorifying, life-filled life that anyone in human history has ever lived. And this means that you do not need sex, marriage, or family in order to lead a uh, biological family, in order to lead a fulfilling, fully meaningful, fully human life. As the church, we need to counter, live into this countercultural vision where both, whether single or married, we are able to live into and point into the greater sign of our union with Christ that God made marriage to point to. Okay, well, a second question that can come up here is, what about when God says no? Like when God says no to certain uh, sexual practices, We can struggle with these, but I believe that the beauty of God's vision helps explain why God says no, that the beauty can help explain the brokenness. Let me explain what I mean. If this is ultimately about image bearing, then this helps explain why adultery is so tragic. It helps explain why God says no to adultery. Adultery is so tragic, not only because of what it does to your spouse, but also because of what it says about God. God is a God who doesn't cheat. God is faithful. God is loyal. And God says no to adultery because he wants us to reflect, to image, to bear his image accurately, to reflect his character towards our spouse. And so when we cheat or when we have an affair, it's not only what it's doing to them, it's what it says about God. It raises the bar on how we live Because it's actually, this is wrapped up with whether our deepest vocation to reflect and bear God's image well in the world. It also helps explain why premarital sex is off limits. Why God says no to sex outside of marriage because God's love is covenantal. God's love is covenantal that God commits to you before he unites with you. That as Jesus prepares to go to the cross, he says, where he's going to be fully united with us through death, he says, this is the covenant shed in my blood. Jesus says, I am with you through thick and thin, through good times and bad, in sickness and health, richer and poor. Not even death will be able to separate us. Jesus is committed to his bride before he unites with his bride. And we are called 
as men and women and how we approach sexual relationships to embody the same kind of posture towards one another, this covenant to reflect and image that covenantal love. This is why the uniting of bodies was intended to be embedded within the uniting of lives because we are designed to reflect an all of life union, the all of life type of union that we are made for with God. God doesn't use us to kind of get somewhere. No, God gives himself to us in covenantal committed love. The beauty of God's vision, it also helps explain why divorce is so painful. It's one of the most painful things we can do. I know you know, growing up as a child of divorce and knowing so many families and friends and just seeing a divorce. And the reality is if, as we have seen, marriage is to be a picture into the union of heaven and earth, then divorce depicts a creation unraveling. It depicts a heaven and earth breaking apart. And I think you often catch a glimpse of this when you hear kids describe divorce who are going through it, right? They'll often use large language that sounds like, man, it feels like the universe is unraveling around them. And they're right. Like the union that brought them into existence is precarious, is unstable, is crumbling. And they're right when they describe it as feeling like creation is unraveling around them. More so, if marriage is also designed to be a window into the union of Christ and his church, then divorce preaches a false gospel. It says that the stability of Christ and our life with him as the church is unstable. It's precarious that it will fracture someday, that our eternity with God, the wedding supper of the Lamb, will accomplish no final peace. And the security of our salvation is insecure. So again, the problem is not only what it does to the other person, it's what it says about God. Now, that does not mean that there are never reasons where divorce might be permissible. Jesus describes some, and Paul describes some, that there are reasons where divorce can be permissible, but even when it's permissible, it's always tragic, right? Nobody knows that better than the person who's enduring the pain of that situation. This also doesn't mean that if, if that's, I know there, for some of us in this room, that's a part of our story, and if that's you, it also doesn't mean that, uh, the, that grace is not there for us as well because the beauty of the gospel, Jesus did not come to beat us up over our past but to fight for our future, right? He came to fight for you and I to rebuild. This also helps explain why same-sex sexual activity is off limits, right? That again, if marriage is designed to be this uh, union into the, the marriage of heaven and earth, then it seems like sexual activity pictures earth above and earth below, which is a cave and which is unable to bear witness to the fullness of, of the beautiful vision of this complementary pair made with and for one another of heaven and earth belonging together. It becomes a picture of Christ with Christ or the church with the church and is unable to display the difference in harmony that we were made for with Christ, that we are different from Christ, and yet we were made to be united with Christ together in union forever. And that doesn't mean that, that uh, it might not be a painful thing in terms of attractions and desires, and Jay talked about that last week and how as a community we all walk together through whatever journey of, of our sexual, uh, our experience of our sexuality might be, that we are here as a church family to walk with one another through all of these things together. Well, the beauty of God's vision, it also helps explain the problem with pornography, right? That the pornography objectifies the other and uses them from a distance for one's own self-seeking pleasure, which is the opposite of God's vision of uh, giving oneself to another and self-giving other-centered love that forms a communion of love with the potential of life-giving love that mirrors and reflects the life-giving love of God. Okay, well, so the beauty of God's vision helps explain why God says no to some things. I think a uh, third question that can come up for us is, well, what about obedience? What about when sexual, being sexually faithful is hard? I believe the beauty of God's vision can help motivate us. It can help motivate you, and here's the way I like to think of it. I believe that the beauty of God's vision, it helps move us from a rule-keeping mindset to an image-bearing mindset. 
Right? What I mean by that is, I think many of us can have, and sometimes churches can negatively promote kind of a rule-keeping mindset, which is like, hey, just keep the rules, and then God will bless or reward you. You know, like, a, there can be this sense of like, okay, if I don't have sex until I get married, and then God's going to bless me with this amazing spouse, and this off-the-wall sex life, and this beautiful family, and everything's going to be perfect. But I've known so many friends who are like, man, I lived faithfully, I did it, and I still, and, and they still maybe are single and don't want to be, or found themselves in a really difficult marriage or found themselves sexually assaulted, even something horrible. And the reality is, living God's way, life is still hard, and we live in a broken world. And even if we go about things the right way, it doesn't mean that hard things and difficult things won't happen. And we need to guard against setting up false promises that things always will, because God's not a widget machine. You can't put in X behavior and get out Y result, right? Like, things are more complicated than that. But I believe that the gospel gives us a deeper resource for sexual faithfulness and obedience, which is this goal of image bearing, rather, where the goal is rather to reflect the character of Christ, to image God well, a God whose love is covenantal and faithful and loyal and self-giving and sacrificial and enters into a, a communion with another and brings forth life-giving love. That, that These are the ideals that we, we want to strive for. And here's the problem is you give me a rule, and, and the rules are there for a reason. Like God's wise and generally often like his ways you know, will help lead to better flourishing, but you give me a rule, I'm going to see how close I can get to the edge without stepping over the boundary, Right? And the rules can give you that boundary. They can give you kind of a red flashing warning light. Like, hey, warning, you know, don't, don't, don't cross this line because that could be dangerous for you. And we could do that. But, but the, the reality is, man, you give this boundary and we might try and just see how close can I get without, without crossing. But give me a God to reflect at the center. And I want to move away from that. I want to move into the center like that you get to move into the center of God and go, God, I want to experience your faithful love for me. God, I want to experience your covenantal love for me. You can go, God, I want to encounter your faithful, sacrificial, self-giving love. And God, I want it to so flood my life and transform my life from the inside out that you would reflect. I want to reflect that faithful love to the world. And that you would be able to reflect and image the divine love of God and how you approach romance or friendships or relationships, the sexuality, gender, the body, all these conversations, that they would be animated and driven by the divine love of God. That's your higher calling. It's not just to keep some rules. It's to bear the image of God, to grow in bearing that accurately and reflecting that well. Okay, well, the fourth question that can come up is, what about unfulfilled sexual desire? What do we do when we have this desire and we just don't know where to go with it? I believe the beauty of God's vision shows you what to do with unfulfilled sexual desire. See, often I think we feel like we've only got two options. On the one side, there's what I like to call the stuff it option, right? Sometimes at church we feel like, man, I got these desires. I don't know what to do with them. Just stuff it, you know? Just stop it, you know? And, and we can try and like, okay, I'm just not going to act out on those and push them out. And then we, we, we can get uh, frustrated and cynical and bitter. And there's a danger of becoming legalistic. And uh, we can become like the older brother in the prodigal son story, if you're familiar with that story where the brother just becomes, you know, he's doing the right things, but he's cynical against his father and all that. I think some of us go that route. We feel like, okay, I'm serving God by just stuffing my desires. And we get so frustrated that then we swing to the other extreme, which our culture tells us to do, which is just go for it, right? It's it's not stuff it, but just go for it. You do you, go do what you want to do, live your life, have as much sex as you want, as many partners as you want, anywhere, you know, like just, just go for it. You do you. And the problem with this is the other is it can lead to lawlessness. It can lead to running in these directions that lead to destructive behavior and things that run, wreak havoc in our lives and hurt other people around us. And you're going that direction and it can just lead to disaster and we can become more distant from God as we're living. We can become like the younger brother in the prodigal sin story, finding ourselves off in a distant land, far from the Father, just living for ourselves. And the gospel, the beauty of God's vision, it offers a third way saying, hey, don't just stuff it. Don't just go for it. Rather, redirect it. That those desires that Jay talked about this last week, that sexuality, it's bigger than just sex. Is this a desire, a longing for union? Right? And take that desire, that longing for union, and bring it to God and go, God, you are the greater union I was made for. I want to bring vulnerably my desires, the things that I'm struggling with, the things that I find unfulfilled or unmet or I'm hurt or I'm wounded or I'm broken. I want to bring them to you in Holy Spirit. I ask that you administer to me. I want to bring these things to you and ask that you administer to me. 
I think one of the challenges we can find ourselves going, well, Josh, that's kind of a cheap consolation prize, right? Like, I want the real thing, like sex. And we kind of think that's the real thing. And you know, with God, that's kind of a cute metaphor. Let me say to you right now, that gets it completely backwards. Union with God is the real thing that you were made for. Sex and marriage, that's the metaphor. God's created that as a sign. But union with God is the greater reality that you and I were made for. And the fact that we often think that that's just a cheap consolation prize shows how far we've come from Christ's vision for us of that being the deeper place where meaning, fulfillment, and fullness of life is found. I found it helpful in this as we come before God vulnerably in prayer with our desires to ask, what's the desire beneath the desire, right? That I think often beneath the desire for sex, the desire often to feel wanted, to be known, a desire for intimacy, to know and be known. And those are all actually beautiful things that God has made each and every one of us for, single or married, wherever you may be at in life. He has made you to know that you are wanted, you are loved for an intimacy as beloved. But ultimately, the place where those are most meaningfully and powerfully found fulfilled is in Christ, is in God. So we can bring him vulnerably those desires in prayer, encountering and seeking our union with him. All right, well, the fifth and final question that can come up is, what if I've messed up? You might be going, man, Josh, if you knew where I've been and what I've done and all that, man, you might just go, what do I do with that? Well, the reality is that the beauty of God's vision, it is all about grace. It's all about grace. Maybe you're feeling shame right now or guilt over your past or remorse for things that you've done or that, that you've experienced. And the beauty of the gospel, again, is that God goes after us as a spouse with a checkered past. And he came not to beat you up over your past, but to fight for your future. And in our union with Christ as his bride, in this union, he takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. He exchanges our rebellion for his obedience, his perfection for our rejection. That the beauty of God's vision is it's all about grace. We come to him as we are and he pours into us, he builds us up, he serves us, he cares for us and he makes us shine in the radiance of his love. I would suggest to you this morning that God's vision for our bodies is beautiful. It's more beautiful and compelling than anything else our culture has on offer. So you don't need to apologize or be bashful about the Christian sexual ethic any more than you would apologize for like owning the Mona Lisa or living in the Taj Mahal, right? Like it's glorious, it's beautiful. And the beauty of this vision is for all of us, whether you're married in a good marriage or married in a marriage that's struggling, whether you're single and wanna be or single and don't wanna be, and actually, on that singleness conversation, man, a friend of mine and Jay's Nassim is going to be here in a couple of weeks talking about singleness even more. And man, you got to be here for that week. She's amazing. And I, 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 I'm, going to be ta- I'm going to be listening on, on, on that one because I want to hear that message myself. It's so good. But the reality is this beauty of this vision is for all of us, wherever we find ourselves this morning. The reality is your body is a sign that points to the beauty of creation and the beauty of God's life-giving love for you. You and I, we were made to display a more beautiful union. That God and his vision for us, God's not holding out on you. God wants nothing holding you back. So the next time somebody asks you, why are sunsets beautiful? You can tell them they are prophets proclaiming a greater reality. That you were made for beautiful union. You were made for union with God. All right, well, the band is going to come up, and as we prepare to worship and to receive communion this morning, we are invited to Christ, where heaven and earth meet. We're invited to Christ, where heaven and earth meet. We come to the table of his body broken and his blood shed, and the bread and the wine. We come to the bread of his body broken, invited into communion with him. It means union with, we're invited to communion, we're invited to union with our king through the bread of his body broken. We are invited to life with him through the wine of his blood shed for us as his bride. This table, it's all about grace. 
Jesus not only gave himself to us 2,000 years ago, he gives himself to us today, that Christ our King is risen, ascended, exalted. And as we come to the sacrament, this means of grace, of his body and his blood, Jesus wants to give himself to you today, to meet you wherever you may be at, and to offer you the greatest thing you could ask for, is union with himself. As we come this morning, I invite you to come knowing that union with him, it is more radiant than the most wild sunset. It is more life-giving than where stream and soil come together. That union with Christ is more transcendent than the mountaintop. All these things are signs that point to the greater reality of our beautiful union with God. Would you join me in prayer? Jesus, thank you that you have made us for yourself and that our hearts are restless until they find our rest in thee. So Jesus, we bring you this morning our restless hearts. God, I pray for this morning. I know given this topic, God, that there are many of us in this room right now, God, that there are wounds that we bear for things that have been done to us or for remorse of things that we've done. We come to you, Jesus, and I pray that through the power and presence of your spirit, you are alive, you are risen, you are exalted, and you are here with us as your people today. And I pray that through your presence right now, Jesus, minister to the wounds of your people. Lord, for those who have suffered in this arena at the hands of others, Lord, I pray that you administer your healing your vision for them, that you see them, that you know, that you would care for us in those deepest places, God. For those who are experiencing remorse over things of their past, God, I pray, Lord, that we would experience this morning through your presence, the washing, cleansing power of your forgiveness. You who laid down your life to wash as pure and spotless as your people, as your bride. Jesus, I pray for those this morning who are in a marriage or a romantic relationship marked by difficulty, God, where there's frustration or confusion or uh, th those relationships can be some of the most difficult, God. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would bring your healing power at work, that you would bring, God, a fresh vision and the resources and community and support and things, God, to build into that vision together of reflecting your life-giving love to one another in the world. Father, uh, we come to you as your people and we pray for all of us, wherever we might be this morning, Lord, we want to be a people and a place where heaven and earth are united in us and through us, God. That for the San Jose area, God, that we would be a people here where your kingdom come, your will done on earth as in heaven, Lord, through our union with you as our king, us as your bride, you as our king, that the union of heaven and earth of you, Christ, with us as your church, which shine far and wide for all the world to see. Jesus, in your name and for your glory that we pray. Amen.